We're glad to present your speaker, Brother N. B. Hardiman. I love to preach, and to me it's rather an easy matter, so to do. And when you hear of me again, unless providentially hindered, I'll be telling the story that never grows old. I'll leave you tomorrow, and right soon begin a meeting at Stillwater, Oklahoma, and then in southwestern Texas. <clears throat> and thus I travel around quite a bit, but I tell the same story regardless of where it is. The Church of Philippi was the first one established on European soil. It was not intended to be on the part of the apostles at first <clears throat> because on the second journey of Paul with Silas now as his partner and Timothy being taken in, they started up through Asia Minor northward as far as Bithynia, bordering on the Black Sea. But the Spirit forbade their going further and turned them westward, and they found themselves at Phobos, just on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea. And while there, as you know, a vision appeared. A man from Macedonia was saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Loosing from Phobos, they went with a straight course westward bound, past the island of Samothracia and landed at Neapolis, the seaport. And from there, they went up to the interior city of Philippi, a very prominent city named after the father of Alexander the Great, and near whose place one of the noted battles of all history was fought at which time the destiny of the civilized world was hanging in the balance. Paul went there and found out about the religious status and learned that some women were out by the riverside disposed to worship and to them he went, preached unto them, and their acceptance and attending to the word spoken resulted in the establishment of the Philippian Church. Now with that congregation, Paul stayed for a while. And I think numbers of us ought to get a lesson from that. We sometimes go out and hold a meeting, like Brother Estes contemplates to begin tomorrow night, in a new field. Let's hope that he may go and preach the gospel, as I'm sure he will, and that numbers will be. Well, many times after a week or two weeks of that preaching, the preacher goes off and leaves them, and in six months he can't find scarcely one of them. Now Paul stayed with the Philippian church until it was rooted and grounded in the faith. And after a while he left and went on by Apollonia, down to Thessalonica, and then to the Orion to Athens, and founded a colony. And having preached there, went back, and while his prisoner at Rome, wrote certain letters, one of which was this one to the Philippian church. It's a chapter, or a letter of four chapters, that can be read in just a little while, and committed to memory in a reasonable time, and in that letter, I think you won't find a single criticism, nor a review, or unpleasant sentence in the entire letter. And that's rather unusual. Uh, I want you to think of some of the things that are found in it. Paul said in second chapter, as I recall, verse 12, Wherefore, beloved, as ye have always obeyed, just stop a minute. What church could Paul write to now in Montgomery and say, Brethren, you have always obeyed? 
रक्षक के धर्म विष्णु का आधारित इस ऑर्डिनरी मीडियम के He could write that to them because some of the rest of them have no way to obeyed as they should. Uh, but he said to the Philippians, you have always obeyed. Not as in my presence only, but now much more than my absence. Therefore, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do. Do therefore all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as light in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, nor labored in vain, ye birthed. And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Now, where can you find anything in any literature comparable to the sublimity and the grandeur of just such things? Again, find it a bit. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, lovely. If there be virtue, there be praise, think on these things. Those things which you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And now I rejoice at the last that you carry me and flourished again. Wherein also you are careful, but you lack opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one, For I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, there will to be content. I know how to be a faith, I know how to abound, everywhere, and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wouldn't it be fine? For this congregation and all others of this city and elsewhere, just to buckle down, so to speak, and learn things that Paul wrote, until you can store them up in your heart and call upon them and talk about getting lonesome when that kind of a spell comes over you, recite and extract from these letters, and you find joy and rejoicing as did he. Uh, but tonight I have another statement from the book of Philippians. Uh, only this. Let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and be with you or else be absent from you, I want to hear of your affairs. That you all stand fast with one mind and one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing be terrified by your adversary, which to them, that is, which faith on your part, is to them a token of damnation, perdition, but to you it's an evidence of salvation and that of God. And those are sublime thoughts gathered from this wonderful letter. I want to make those words mine to this congregation tonight and transfer them and adopt them as expressive of my real sentiments and to those others who have so kindly led yourselves and your presence and influence to this meeting. Only this. For what for? Let your conversation, let your manner of life, as the revised version says, let your manner of life or conversation be as becoming the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to you again or else be absolute possible, I want to hear from you. And here's what I want to hear, that with one mind and one spirit, You stand fast, striving together 
for the face of the gospel and nothing be disturbed or certified by your adversary. Your faith is to them an evidence of damnation, but to you it's a guarantee of salvation and that of God Almighty. Now the chances are that uh, I'll not come back to Montgomery again. It's been a long time since I was here, and with the passage of the years, I don't have as many before me as I would have if there were more of them. Uh, and I know how uncertain life is, and how rapidly we're passing down the way, and I've traveled over quite a bit of territory, and hence mixed around not very often. But whether I ever come again or not, those sediments are mine, transcribed. I think I can say that, not simply because of your presence, but because of the real, genuine appreciation that I have of such contact and such association as has been ours. Brethren, let your conversation be as the come of the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> Do you know this set of watching with the preachers? They are included in it, but it's not directed unto them. But it wasn't addressed unto elders, but it's addressed unto the church at Philippi. And the sentiments and exhortations are applicable unto all. Let your conversation be as the premise of the gospel of Christ. I grant you that any man honored by the presence of his fellows as I am tonight, supposed to speak to them regarding matters that transcend the realm of time and launch out into the eternal boundless beyond, I'm willing to admit that man's conversation ought to be as becometh the gospel of Christ. The man that's called into the sick place where sorrow shadows are gathering round about to offer any kind of exhortation or comfort, surely that man's conversation ought to be as becometh the gospel of Christ. And finally, when you stand in the presence of death itself and speak the final farewell regarding loved ones who pass from this to the other shore, why, of course, that man's conversation ought to be as becometh the gospel of Christ. But there is no greater obligation upon the preacher than there is any other Christian or member of the body of Christ. Now, just why we ever got the idea that there were different standards by which people are to be measured and church members are graded, I just don't know why that is. I propose to stand upon a common level with every child of God on earth. I know better than any other, unless or do better, and that doesn't always happen. And so all together we stand. But in the estimation of even the church, there are about three standards. One a very high one, up to which the preacher has the measure. And we demand of them certain things that are peculiar to them. Then there's a certain standard a bit lower that we have for our women folks of the church. And they are allowed to do things that if the preachers were to do, they'd be severely criticized. And then there's a third standard for the common members. The world says the lay members. God knows I never read anything about them. I read about line members, but never did read about the lay members. <laughs> but that suggests the idea. <laughs> now get it. If some of you brethren or sisters now are permitted to curse, that's plain old she that lets curse. And yet being pretty good standing in the church, Brother Rex turned here and Brother Esther says the very same right. Well, why not? 
their slumbermen blew of them with reference to charity and their conversation becoming the gospel and it does with you, not a particle. And if it's all right for you to get on a wheel by taking some moonshine uh, or some genuine liquor, why, give your preachers out and let's all stand our fall together. As Franklin said, we'll must hang together or we'll hang separately. I've been impressed with things of that kind. With two brethren from Henderson, I went one time to Memphis. <clears throat> and we parked at the Gilson Hotel and had dinner and were seated on the mezzanine floor. And after we fell, they said, Brother Hardiman, <clears throat> you stay here and rest and we're going out in town. <laughs> well, I said, I'm not tired, but he's sick, and I'll go with you. Oh, I know, don't you go, and you just take it easy, and we won't be gone long. <laughs> well, I said, I'm not the kind of proposed to pursue my crowd, uh, and I'm going to stick with you. And you ask me to wait, I said, you only one of the ones, by the way. And the one that you just wait while they went out. <laughs> Well, I just insisted and made them believe that if you go, I'll go too. I never did get them to tell me what they had in mind, but they didn't go anywhere unless I went with them. <laughs> and I've asked them immediately. Both of them were dead now, but I asked them beforehand, just what did you have in mind? And why were you so interested in my good health and my resting? <laughs> while you went out and took in the town. Now, all uh, of that is far into the teaching of the Bible. Let's stand together and let all of our conversation be as become the gospel of Christ. And what one of us permitted to do, the other has the same idea. Now, that old conception that the world is about the two classes, the preachers in one class and the membership of another is so far into the Bible teaching. I sometimes thought that people thought that the preacher was made out of Tennessee soil and the rest of them out of Alabama and Mississippi. <laughs> but I don't think that's so by a long sight. <laughs> so let your conversation be not pretend but genuine springing from the right heart within and motive prompting every word. Let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. We are very particular about having things that are becoming and fitting. While you women in adorning your home, in various rooms, you want certain colors, up on the walls, certain color for the drinks, and so on. How do you want them? Oh, we want them to be becoming, and all blending. And then when you go to the store to buy articles of clothing, why you suggest, well, uh, things not becoming to me. I can't wear pink. Why can't you? Not scared of it, are you? Uh, now just why can't you wear it? And why does Mother uh, to get him a green suit and be becoming? Uh, well, it's a part of all this so to do. Uh, and that's why we don't do those things. We want it becoming. And I think that's exactly right. Now then, my conversation uh, ought to be and must be if God smiles upon us in harmony and blending with that of the gospel of God's Son. I have been impressed and still am that the church is not thought of as highly as it ought to be. I don't believe that in the market of the world the church is selling a bill of power, but many times below. And I'm not blaming the world who stresses out and criticize and find fault. They're strong for them. Now the only way to overcome that is to set a high standard and live up to it. 
sober, the world will have nothing to say in the same affair can over accomplish anything to the detriment of the cause of Christ. Let your conversation be as become as the gospel. Now eat my swine and sluice of swine and filthy pork. If that boozen is all right with the church, what does the world think about it? I don't think much of the church. If that's a sample of it. Now if that fellow's speech, well as you that, are in accordance and harmony, then I think more of the Masonic Lodge or parts of the cute club plan than I do of a pretended religious outfit like that. And we are to blame when the world criticizes it. And if you just stop and think about it, they have right to. And I join them along that line. Now let's overcome that by living our manner of life, be commensurate, harmonious with the gospel of Christ. That whether I come to you again or not, I want to hear from you. For what is it, Paul? I want to hear that you stand fast. If I'd written that, I guess I would have said that you stand fast. I know what that means. Stay put. That you be not carried about by every wave of doctrine, but that you get your feet well rooted in the soil of God's eternal truth and melted in that which has come down through inspiration. And stand fast with one mind and one heart, one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Why is that your work to strive, but not have strive among us? Too much of that by far, and we're divided to the detriment of the cause and to our shame over so many things that to me are not worthy of that which they produce. And uh, but stand fast with one mind and one spirit striving together. Why, you know what that means. If Brother Rex Turner there pulled from this bed 40 pounds in that direction, and I pulled 40 pounds in this direction, why, you know the thing just stays right there. We have moved it a particle. But if we get on the same side of it and double our strength of 80, then the something will turn loose. We can accomplish things. What is it all spell to get striving together? I used to drive up and of course had the vocabulary that necessarily goes with them. And I rejoiced when I had a fine yoke of oxen that would sit together. And we forced it back there and was pulling the thing loose at both ends. But I've had them that they strove just as hard as possible, but they were pulling against one another until there was a knot on the outside of the neck, just in front of the boat. And on a slippery bridge, when it rained just a little bit, drive up, and there they lean and pull. And I recall I had one once to drop off, and there suspended by the yoke and the bow, and had to cut the key. Now you see the folks may not know a thing on earth of what I'm talking about, but I just can't help it. I'm sorry <clears throat> that you missed some of the best things of life. You know what to do with a team of that kind? When they strive one against the other, let the other fellow have it. Swap them off. Or sell them. Or do something. Get rid of them. After that, my father had horse team. And I drove them for a spell. And I delighted because of the splendor that characterized them. And I know something about things of that kind. I've seen great big jackal gray Persian horses brought that weighing 1,500 pounds, stepping along down the road, looks like it's impossible for anything to hinder them. There they are, perfect show, 
Why they had to find his harness in the country? Brass top paintings, leather toes, leather back stands, belly burned shoe straps, plank straps, and all that together with passers flying from the breezes. And there they stretched along, perfect to call it. But when the wheel dropped down the mud hole and up to the axle, they stopped. <coughs> And some of you may know what stop to get ready to happen. Well, the fellow was driving understands the trouble, and he talked to the master for a little spell and give the word to go, and the ball falls. Now, that's the one on the right hand side from behind. The ball falls, runs his father, the other just saying. Well, they got no weapon, that time. And then he took some talk nicely to them when he could beat the light on them. And finally, he was the word, and the lead horse lunges forward, and the other one stabbed him. And that got no fast. And then by and by, he begins to fool with them and work up, and they run forward and back, and he got their feet off back and forth and work up a public perfect lot lava. And full well over there. And finally, do you folks know what happened? One of them will lay his chin over on the other side just in front of a hand. That means I'm false. I'm right here. And you can't move them to save your soul. Bless them out. Beat them. Do anything. They're right there. Now I've seen the fellow has picked them out with all their fine equipment. And then some fellow come along with a little pad and weigh about 800 pounds. They have on rope bladder, shirt collars, cotton back stand, no belly band at all, and iron curves, and traces, and no friction or blind steps or any of that outfit, <clears throat> and no pretense whatsoever. Well, he just puts one off the over the thumb or pole and pulls them up and gets stuck, places the palm and fire and gives the word and they place their eight feet right along together and move right on out. And the big fire seems standing over there. It looks like they're the same with two old things by the way. Now what's the philosophy of it? Those of the new group were striving together. Now you might have a combination of 500 feet. You throw it up in the steel Half of you to do this, the other one does. Then when we want to do something over here, well, we'll get it on that side. Why, you can't get anywhere with that. But I have a lot of subtractions when that's the case, by the way. And have just a few and get them to pull together and things will move on out as they ought to move. Well, that's what Paul has in mind. Brethren, strive together. Well, someone said, we just can't all see alive. Oh, I guess we can. Paul thought so. But shrink is one thing. I beseech you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there be no divisions among you, but that you all be joined together in one mind and one spirit. Now, if that's impossible, Paul was just talking, contrary to what might take place. <clears throat> well, how can we be together? Well, there's just one way. If I'm headed and arrogant and bull-headed <clears throat> and determined that my way and my opinion shall prevail, it's hopeless and helpless and hapless. Just can't do that. And if somebody else is strong in that nature, and he's determined to have his way about it on some kind of a pet theory, why, of course, that gets so fast. Well, how can he do it? If all of us were just speak as the Bible directs, and march on with those things that are plainly put, and sacrifice our opinion and preferences, and walk by faith, you couldn't get up a first to save your life in matters of that kind. In a sexual affair, oneness, why the slogan of the pioneer preachers was this, in matters of faith, unity. 
in matters of opinion, liberty, in all things, charity, and it ought to be adopted now. I am embarrassed numbers of times when I go places and find the Church of the Lord's society in the faded faction and different ones. Why over here, for instance, this, this kind of a crowd, they object to something. Over here is another one, they oppose this. And over there is a third one, they have a hobby on which they are feasting evermore. And what's the result? The church is ridiculed correctly and looked down upon by decent people. Those things ought not to be, and they're not necessary, that should prevail. <clears throat> but Paul said, brethren, I want to see that you strive together, I want to hear from you, with one faith, one spirit, one mind, striving for the furtherance of the gospel of Christ. While the church of God is not striving for, for popularity, it's not striving to make money and to hold it up. I've gone to places and the president said, Brother Arthur, this congregation has $5,000 in the bank. Oh, so bless your soul, the church is not a banking institution. Spend it. Next Sunday has some more, and the next first day some more. And this side of the church holding up is wholly out of order. When there are so many calls, perfectly worthy. Then what you have in the right direction and keep the thing going. Start together for the faith of the gospel. There are those round about who have never heard it as yet. Why, dare say, within the corporate of Montgomery, Alabama, <clears throat> there are more than 5,000 who've never heard a gospel sermon. And yet we're larger at ease in Zion. There are those who need teaching day by day in such schools as you have out here where the Bible is taught. And I trust free from all things except the Bible. And thus become an influence for wonderful good in the accomplishment of the purpose of government. Strive together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing be terrified. The devil and his agents are trying to embarrass and humiliate the church of the Lord. They make fun of so many things taught in the Bible. Well, let me tell you a thing or two <clears throat> along that line. When I first commenced to preach and for a number of years after, I could not preach a single distinctive thing characteristic of the Church of Christ, but when I got through, some fellow would say, Will you affirm that in today? <laughs> and when you two times it, well, I never did run away from him. Yes. Yeah. Well, what's the result? Why, we have debates all, all over the country, in every schoolhouse, in every town, in every village, under the tent, in the brush arbors, all over the land. And finally, they decide that we're not getting anywhere in opposing that which is proclaimed by gospel preachers. And now what? Oh, it's not very refined. It's not culture to have a debate. And we haven't got time to spend it down and run them over a bed. God knows I'd feel the same way if I'd uh, the sinning that a whole lot of denominations of hell by gospel preachers. Why won't you discuss matters? <laughs> Now, men need to tell me, well, I'm just a brother. No, you're not. Get off by yourself and do it. But why not meet some man in discussion of affairs? I just have a little suspicion that one of the finest things that could contribute to the cause of Christ in this city would be a first class, high tone religious discussion of just such differences as for the among us. I would want to wrangle, not a going for a dog fall and a fight and a low down strap and get down into affairs of many conceptions, but 
upon the motive of sin, swear for it, contend for it, and be not certified to humiliated nor embarrassed in innocence whatsoever. Why, I believe the Church of Christ has the truth, of course, or I wouldn't be connected with it. There's not one single principle in the foundation, but I would stand for it and affirm it against the characters of this earth. But when they want me to affirm now the practice of the membership, I have to beg to be excused. <laughs> I'll condemn for the doctrine all that enough, and for what we teach, and I'll strive for its success, and that's as far as can be said about it. <clears throat> what happened otherwise? Let's start together for the faith of the gospel of God's Son, and in nothing whatever be embarrassed or certified by our adversaries. When we talk about it, and think that faith is a token of perdition. But to you it's a token of salvation and that of brother Mike. Yeah. Friends, I wish that I could live long enough to see the gospel triumph in so many places of earth and to see the church of the Lord established all over this land of ours I wish that I could see young men, young women, thoroughly converted to God's truth and would assume the obligation binding upon them. I'd love to have all men who love the truth buckle on the armor of the Lord, raise a lost the banner, march under the leadership of him who has never yet lost a single conflict. Until by and by, silver has to dig our brow. And our chiefs will for us for the finial of time and form ascended back to another earth. Until we come to shuffle off all its marble. When the great captain of our salvation will bid us to stack our arms on the glad plains of a never ending eternity. And by the lower side, our old armor scarred by many a conflict. And at last to hang our sword upon the jasper walls of the eternal city, while the palms of victory and crowns of glory, we sweep through morning's gates of eternity into the blissful paradise that lies beyond, the eternal home of the soul, a course which the shadows have never been cast. But while rays of light, punctuated by the stars of eternal glory, are evermore, written across the Arctic sky. Now talk about being faithful unto death. It just seems to me that the nearer we come to the grave, the more loyal and the more zeal should be characteristic of our efforts on every hand. And yet I've seen young people, and you have too, enthusiastic about the church, wonderful workers, and then as they grow older, become loose, lax, and indifferent, and take out, and die and go to hell at last. Why that ought not to be, of course, but to continue until life's race is won, if ever for this victory is won, until we come to lay aside all this mortal and soon our opinion for eternal habitation in that blissful home of the soul across which no shadows are ever cast. <clears throat> but to enjoy all of that and to be assured of the results, I must while here in simple childlike humility put my faith and trust and confidence in Jesus Christ God's Son and my Savior. I must resolve by God's grace to turn from every sin away. Renounce those things conquered to heaven's will. Then to sanctify my lips in confession. The Pharisees and Pharisees know no other man. 
And as the Bible teaches, be building into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from which I rise to walk in newness of life, and then become to walk in it, until the grave comes to claim our bodies, and God then will gladly claim our spirits and bid us come home.